Hey everyone, welcome back. My name is Sam. And I'm Melissa. I grew up in the FLDS community. It is a polygamous group run by Warren Jeffs, which I moved out of when I was 18 years old. I was raised LDS and Sam and I have been married for eight years and have two beautiful babies. Yes, and today we are going to be covering slash reacting to Elizabeth Roundy's story and her missing daughter. But before we get into her story, we quickly wanted to let you all know about an opportunity to help support Holding Out Help, an organization who helps people who do leave polygamy um, and helps give them the resources they need to go from isolation to independence. And they are having their annual gala fundraiser coming up on March 10th. Yeah. We are so excited. It is in Draper, Very. Utah. We are coming up from Las Vegas. We will be there. And I know that there's still a bunch of tickets left. If anybody else is in that area or would like to go, we would love to meet you. We'd love to help support this, um, this awesome group. And they are going to be doing a special um, meeting and meet and greet basically with the cast from Keep Sweet, Pray and Obey. Yeah. So if you enjoyed that documentary or you, yeah, or you just want to be able to support this awesome organization, then please come. Um, you can buy tickets on their website of holdingouthelp.org. And their guest speakers are, like I said, mostly cast from Keep Sweet, Pray and Obey, Sam Brower, the New York Times bestselling author, private investigator, and co producer of the film. Charlene Jeffs, a former wife of Lyle Jeffs. Uh, Tanya O'Toole, who's the executive director of Holding Out Help. Cheryl Merrill is an associate, associate clinical mental health counselor who counsels the Holding Out Help clients. So you can learn a little bit more about the health, uh, the mental health care that they get. Uh, Lisa Wall, who obviously uh, has an impactful story about her journey to freedom. And Roger Hool is an attorney for former FLDS wives and their children. And it was also on Keep Sweet, Pray, and Obey. So that's quite the cast. That's quite a, the that, lineup. That, that sounds great. And we're very excited to, yes. to be there as well. So if any of you do end up uh, showing up or if you're able to come, please come and find us and say hello. Absolutely. And we will leave a link to their website below where you can buy tickets if you would like to join us there for their gala and their fundraiser. Back to Elizabeth Roundy's story. We uh, just want to kind of, we, we watch this news clip. There's part one and part two. Uh, I believe it's a, they, it was done up in East Idaho. Yep, it's East Idaho News, and it was Nate Eaton who was the person who interviewed um, Elizabeth yes. for this. Yes, and there was a part one, part two of her story, and we watched both of them. It's a very interesting and impactful story that she has, and uh, so we're just wanting to kind of discuss some of the different uh, very interesting topics that she brought up in her while she was sharing her story yeah and we'll leave the link to both of those videos down below as well so you can go and watch the original news stories and yeah there were so many things as we were listening through that are things that sam has said time and time again on our channel and she was reiterating those and then also new things and obviously her leaving as a woman and being separated from her children absolutely heartbreaking and right now she's just pleading to try to find her young daughter who is missing because she is fleeing back to the FLDS. So we will get Which is so interesting all right? into that. Yes. Yeah, so let's uh, jump right into this and uh, we have quite a few topics that we found very interesting throughout the, her story that we will touch on. Yeah. Um, one of the main things that I thought was interesting right from the get go is that she talked about the fact that her father had originally been LDS. And then he split off into a group known as the priesthood group. And I wanted to ask you, but I was trying to like hold back my questions for Sam until we were live on here to be able to have it be like authentic answers. She likes to catch me off guard with these questions. <laughs> well, I feel like it gives like, I don't know, there's something about in the moment questions. Yes. But did you in the Hilldale, Colorado City know about the Idaho group or had you ever heard of the priesthood group? So that's a very interesting question. And... I because to I've heard of the priesthood group. I have heard of that term. I didn't really know much about them. And as far as Idaho, I was more familiar with the Canada group. I didn't realize there were uh, people in Idaho. And I don't know for sure. Does it say where in Idaho? Maybe it was close to the border oh, of Canada. They said that I don't remember. But uh, anyway, so I didn't. 
I assume that all of that, all of the people up there were a part of the Canadian group. Obviously, I was wrong because she was a part of the Idaho group. So priesthood group, yeah, or the priesthood group. So anyway, it's something I had heard about, but I don't know much about them. But it was interesting that she was sharing that like they still believed in the prophets at that time when mm -hmm. her father converted. It was Roy Johnson, and I know we've mentioned before that oftentimes. Um, the LDS church, like as it progresses or if it makes any changes, then a lot of people will split off and become right. fundamental. So her father doing that is, um, I mean, it, it is kind of hard to convert to the FLDS church. It might have been easier back then. Like now people are very suspicious. It was a lot easier back then. Yes. Back in Roy Johnson and uh, uh, John Y. Barlow before him. Those earlier prophets definitely made it a lot easier for people that wanted to join the church. And my, my own grandfather, that was one of the founders of the FLDS church, uh, he was actually had a big influence on bringing lots of converts to the church. So oh. in the early days of the FLDS church, there were a lot of people that were, uh, I guess, interested and able to join the church. And even Sam's, um, Sam's father's first wife, the first mother in his family, was also an LDS girl who converted True. and yeah, and so, uh, marrying his father. So it was definitely more of a thing. We get that question sometimes like, oh, can people convert? And now it's a lot harder. They don't yeah. really, they're so like shunned to outsiders. It, it's so secretive now. And they, exactly like you say, they don't want their followers to even associate with the, the outside world very much anymore. So imagine bringing people from the outside world in it's just they don't want that anymore unfortunately that's the way well fortunately i guess now that no one else is joining joining them but but yeah very very more it's a lot more strict now yeah and she talked about the fact that there was like fear lots of fear growing up um lots of fear of separation from her family mm -hmm. um because that had started happening and they started like implementing the super strict rules and she kind of seemed to associate it a lot with when the jeffs even ruin jeffs when he started taking over that there started to be more strict rules um things like pleasure should only be in working and building up of zion and she was talking about at that point she was already married but like her husband came home and was like you know took all the toys from the children which is so sad right like even little children and how that broke her heart the fact that like kids weren't allowed to be Children weren't allowed to be children, that they were only allowed and, uh, Yes. Work. The taking away of the toys and that type of thing, I believe, was Warren's doing. Oh, okay. If I remember correctly, because I do remember that type of thing happening. Uh, People, uh, when I was growing up, under the reign of, <laughs> of Rule and Jess, uh, Warren's father, we were able to have our bicycles, we were able to have toys growing up, at least for the first younger years of my life but as time went on things started to disappear and mm -hmm. we weren't allowed to go out and ride our bikes as much and then some of the toys were yes yeah, so and i know that other families were a lot more extreme than than my own but but it does seem like all of the enjoyable things and the fun toys and that were taking taken away over time yeah that's kind of what she mentioned same with the bikes that they used to take like family bike rides and then they scrapped all their bikes, got rid of anything. And by bikes, we mean bicycles. Not, yeah, bicycles. <laughs> not motorbikes. We looked, at, we looked at motorbikes as a bad thing <laughs> growing up for some reason. Yeah. I thought it was super interesting. She talked about the fact that her father had misheard over the phone that she was going to get to meet the prophet in Salt Lake. So oh. they were coming from Idaho, and, and the prophet was coming from Short Creek. And they were meeting in Salt Lake for this meeting, and the father misunderstood they were just supposed to be having a meeting that it had something to do with marriage. Maybe they'd find out if there was marriage in the future. Um, and when she got there, her and her sister were told, you're here to get married. And they were like, excuse me? Like, we thought we were coming to hear something about marriage, not get married. Um, and I thought it was super brave of her to tell the prophet, like, is it okay if we go back and we pray about it? And she said the prophet was kind of upset at her for um, second guessing or questioning the the matches that he had made, but he actually did let her do that. This was and the prophet and this was, at the time was ruling Jeffs at this time. Yes. Do you think Warren would have done that? I, I don't know. I, I from what I hear, Warren was a lot more intense, and he probably he may have just said, "No, this is what the Lord wants. This is what's happening. You need to accept it." That I could totally see something Warren saying.
Yeah. And and unfortunately, most people were people were afraid of Warren, so they would have just gone along with it. Yeah, I think it's it seemed like kind of a theme in a lot of her story where this woman is just so faithful and she's really trying to pray about the right thing to do. Um, but because of the way she was raised, she continued to make these decisions that she felt like she was getting an answer to her prayers in a certain direction. And they continue to like end up causing her heartache and pain down the road, which was just hard to see. Like, so in this case, she did go back. She prayed for a week and her and her sister felt like it was right to go along with what the prophet had said. And so, <clears throat> excuse me. So they both moved, they got married, they moved to Short Creek and pretty much right after she moved down, they said, okay, you can no longer talk to your family and cut these girls off from their families completely and call their families apostates for questioning anything or not following the rules well enough. It's an interesting timeline. So they get, their father gets a phone call. Your two daughters are to get married. They're two, they take their daughters, they marry them to these men, they move down to Short Creek, Hill, they, I believe living in Hilldale, Utah. I think so. They move to Short Creek. Shortly thereafter, their father gets a phone call. Hey, you're not following the rules. You are no longer a part of the church. Is, that, is it just me that finds that timeline interesting that right after the daughters are taken away from him, in a sense, he is then kicked out as you're no longer needed? Yeah, well, I mean, it kind of goes with the narrative of just the fact that the women are kind of seen as property, right? And so they're going to want to keep, they're going to want to keep the women before they send away the men. Yeah. It seems to be definitely a theme and it's so sad and so heartbreaking. And she talks about the fact that like them saying, okay, you can't interact with apostates anymore. That's not how it was with her family growing up, that she had an apostate sister that was still welcome. And so that was something that was really hard for her. And that's kind of what Sam experienced too. When you first left, he was allowed to talk to his parents. Um, it wasn't like encouraged, yeah. but you could, right? Yes. So this happened, this started, this type of thing started happening back when Rulin was still alive, uh, when Warren's father was still in charge. We started, because if you go back to before Rulin Jeffs, to Roy Johnson, when he was the prophet, uh, it was okay to invite someone that had left the church back home for Thanksgiving or something. Which and, makes sense. Like, <laughs> yeah, as, and, and, and I know that this was the case even when I was very young when Ruthen Jeffs was the prophet because as a very young boy, there, I had one of my, or my oldest brother had left and, or was kicked out, I don't remember. Uh, and over Thanksgiving, I remember seeing him. He would come to our home for Thanksgiving. And this was when I was very, very small. Uh, but shortly thereafter, he no longer was allowed. And then, it, and then after that, it was okay. Now you shouldn't be associating with apostates, and and only the only the father is allowed to communicate with his children that have left or that were uh, forced to leave. And anyway, so it just got over time, got more and more strict. So it sounds like with Elizabeth here, she, growing up, she remembers that it was very relaxed when it came to apostates associating with the family. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's just sad that like she gets moved away from her family. She's getting married. Um, and then now she said like she had to be obedient and submissive to her husband. Like that's what she had been taught her entire life to do. Um, and so she's just doing anything that her husband says, but her husband is following Warren. I know she kind of shares her experience of not really feeling like Warren was the prophet. And this was the second time in her story that she shares where she went and prayed about it a lot. And it kind of hit her that she either needed to, she was going to have to leave or she, if she wanted to be able to stay with her yeah. husband and continue to be with her children and her husband, then she better figure it out that Warren was the prophet. And so even though she prayed, she got the answer that I don't want to ever discredit someone's spiritual experience. So I'm not saying this isn't the answer she got in her prayers. I'm just saying that she had been conditioned that that would have been the answer that she should have received. And that right. was the answer she received. So I'm not trying to discredit her, or her experience, because I believe that she truly felt that that was the right choice. Definitely. It's just so hard to, to not see that, they were influencing these girls like decisions still 
you know, even, even in prayer, they're wanting to do what's right and what's best. But at the end of the day, they still know that if they make a choice different than what the prophet says, there's going to be like real world repercussions in their family and they're going to be torn away from their children. So, so part of their, part of their answer is out of fear. Part of the answer that they feel that they receive from, from heavenly father or God is out of fear that if they don't receive that answer, that something bad could happen to them or their family and uh, on top of that even thinking back myself when you are convinced that something is true because of the way you're taught it's it's very easy to get an answer when you're praying about it or feel that you get an answer that that uh what everything that you've that been reaffirms to, your that reaffirms or that if it goes along with what you were taught that that it feels okay it feels right it feels like this is the most comfortable natural thing that we should continue on with so i i can totally understand where she would get a, an answer to just continue on and follow the the prophet yeah so they continue to follow warren and um they are told she's like it just basically got super strict yeah. um and they were told that they weren't being righteous enough. People were being gathered to Zion. They needed to be more righteous, more righteous. And she talked a lot about um, that it was their fault that Warren was still in prison and how they continued to need to be better. Um, and that it was just super hard to be submissive because she even used the example of like punishing her children too harshly. Like she was doing everything that her husband was saying and that there were times that her and her sister wife, the, the first wife of her husband, you know, was like, this is wrong. We're not being the way we need to be with these children. Um, but they had to punish the way that the father intended. And that as a mom, like broke my heart because I'm a huge believer in like motherly instincts, right? Like we just naturally know how to take care of our children. And I can't imagine how heartbreaking that would be to feel like you can't, you know, she even said like, you, she knew that this isn't how you should be treating children. Like this is too harsh. Like they, they can't be perfect. Children can't be perfect and they shouldn't be punished over every little thing. And yet if she didn't punish them properly, then she would be separated from them. Right. And so it's this constant game of like fear of losing your children <clears throat> while also having to do things that you don't think are actually truly what's best for them. Right. Yeah. And she mentioned as well that her sister wife, the, the wife that, uh, was married to her husband first was also saying the same thing that this is this this feels like abuse like we shouldn't be doing this and she said that she agreed with her but they felt completely powerless to try to stand up against him or say that that's just the way it was the the husband was in charge and what he said was ultimately the the way that things had to go so it's, it's very very sad yeah so in the midst of all of this her husband sent get sent away <clears throat> excuse me um, gets sent away and is told that he didn't raise his family with love. And um, which is so interesting that that was, I wonder how much that reaffirmed the mother's testimony that he was sent away for something like that after they felt like he had been being too harsh with their children. Like, I wonder if that really did was like a testimony builder. Like, how could it not be right? Oh, like, yeah. okay, the prophet was feeling the same way I was feeling about the way that we're handling our family and now my husband's sent away um you can see why the women would just uh, assume that yes the the prophet is receiving revelation from god he knows what's going on within our home uh when in reality it's very likely that somebody spoke up about it mm -hmm. if he was if he was abusing his children someone in the community most likely stood up or confronted him or went to the prophet about it or one of the leaders and then, of course, the leaders are going to say, oh, it was revelation. But yeah. but anyway, you're right. I think that the, the wives were probably just in shock that, oh, wow, the prophet knows what's going on. And that's why he's being sent away. Yeah, she talked about, you know, some more of the crazy things of, you know, families being split, worthy and unworthy members. This happened after Sam had already left, correct? That they oh. started splitting the... the um, the homes even that there were members yes. and non-members and she talked about how her eight-year-old son 
um, weren't considered worthy. Right. Eight-year-old kid, like to go to an eight eight-year-old child and be like, okay, you are not worthy, but your other siblings are like the amount of games. And I know that Sam's, um, some of Sam's sisters and other siblings that left after him have shared stories of that. And I don't want to share too much of their story. And maybe there'll be a time when like they're ready to share that, but it was, yeah, absolutely horrific. The way that they would pit them against each other and the way that they would make people feel completely worthless. Right. And it's just so sad. Yeah. And <laughs> I mean, I can imagine how lesser you would feel from the rest of the family. If all of a sudden there's a wall build up in the middle of the home and you're not allowed to come into the part of the home where the rest of the family is, because for some reason you aren't as good as they you're are. You're not worthy to be in that part. It's just, it's, yeah. it's such and, sick mind games. And honestly, so this is just, this is my theory here. So stay with me. But I think that a lot of the people that were considered unworthy to be members were those that were most honest because everyone had to go meet everyone that was still a part of the church at some, at some point during all of this had to go meet with one of the leaders of the church, whether it was the bishop or, or one of the counselors to the prophet. They had to go meet with them and they would ask them questions that like, are you being worthy of this? Are you obeying certain rules? Are you all these different things that they are required to do? And as long as you said, yes, it seemed like you were fine. But for anyone that was honest and said, actually, no, boom, you're not worthy. So it's it's just sad to think that maybe some of the best, kindest people were those that were considered not worthy. Yeah, so true. Um, she talked about, and I think we had mentioned this before, but in one of the revelations, so right before she got kicked out, um, she said there had been a revelation that had been talking about the the murder of unborn babies and mm -hmm. that the FLDS um, specifically talk about contraception as murder of unborn babies. Obviously, abortion definitely un, um, considered murder of unborn babies. But she said shortly after that revelation where that was brought up, she was kicked out for having a miscarriage. And she believes that it was tied to that revelation, meaning that a miscarriage would also be the murder of an unborn baby, which <laughs> I, I don't have words. I don't have words because of how traumatic and how hard that is on any woman. And especially like as she's talking about it and she's talking about how much she loves her children and how she would never do anything to harm a baby and to be told that that's your sin and that somehow a miscarriage is your fault and you need to be punished and repent for something that you have no control over. I, we know people, we have family friends and family members that have had miscarriages and the, the pain that they go through, through something like that. And then to have someone come tell you, no, it's your fault. Actually, it's, it's because you did something bad. You're no longer welcome here because of that. Like I, I can't even fathom. I can't fathom it. It also shows though, that they're not giving any type of education at all to these women either. I'm sure there are women out in the community who thought that it was their fault or that it was because of a sin instead of realizing the biological aspect of it and the scientific aspect of like what causes miscarriages or what can cause miscarriages or um, yeah, just the actual function of, of what's going on. So yeah. that's, yeah, it was heartbreaking to hear her talk about that, honestly. Um, so she left, um, when she left, she did take her eight year old who was also a non-member. So she had one of her children and there were four of them still out in the community. And, um, they did tell her that she could make arrangements for them before she left, which she tried to like put off as long as possible. Um, at this point, it was a caretaker who was like, you need to leave, you need to leave. And she really tried hard to make special arrangements to make sure her children were with people that she could care and trust because her kids were from 12 to two years old. Right. Leaving a two year old into somebody else's hands. I do not care how much you trust them. Um, I just can't imagine. And she even talked about how absolutely horrific it was, but they, she was told that it was going to be like three weeks to three months. And I think if you feel like, okay, there's like this finish line, like if I repent and I do everything, then I can be back even with my two-year-old, you know, in a couple weeks or a couple months at most, then at least 
they and basically they, gave her false hope. That's what they told her. Yeah, that you you'll oh, no worries, you'll be back soon. You just need to be away for a, a what did he say? Did she say a couple weeks or yeah, a couple months? Yeah. They told her 3 3 weeks to 3 months. Uh, just okay. I mean, so at least she had hope. Okay, well I'll go and just get this over with and come back and be with my family. That was her hope. Little did she know. Yeah. What was it? 5 years? Did she spent she... a total of 5 years. She didn't know for the first 3 years. It was after three years that she ended up being able, she was getting really worried about her kids. And she finally was able to call, had one phone call in the five years to her children and found out that her kids were separated, that they weren't with the people that they were supposed to be with and that everything that she had planned for them was in shambles right from the beginning. Right. And so she's been away for three years and she had talked to her husband who was also still kicked out and said, I want to go get our kids. And he was like, just be patient. And so it wasn't until in the fifth year, she decided, like, I'm going to go pick up my kids. And the church wasn't, the leaders were not doing anything to give her any more hope that she was going to get to be with them. As a matter of fact, they just kept asking for money. That was all that they called her for. And, and the son that she had had with her this whole time, that I, I don't know if he was eight when they were he was first eight when they forced left. out. So it was, yeah. You know, he wasn't in a good situation either, she says. I mean, you know, they were just working, trying to survive, and he didn't really have uh, – she was trying to homeschool him, I guess, but mm -hmm. he didn't really have much to do. I mean, he was just kind of sitting around, and, oh, man, I can't imagine uh, what how hard it would have been for both of them just being exiled and not really knowing any – I, or having any idea of when they might return with their family. Yeah. And she talked about the fact that um, one of the things her husband had mentioned to her, and she knew this as well, is if she went to go pick up her kids and she went against the church in that way, then she would be considered yeah. an apostate. And so doing that, she knew meant that she would never be able to return to the church, which had been her whole life. Um, and she had to eventually make that decision, which she did. Um, thank goodness. But the part of her story that I find like we hear stories and, you know, especially as an outsider, I feel like it's so easy to just like cheer on like when you get the women to leave, if they can just leave or if they could go just get their children, if we could get their children for them. And you don't really hear a lot about how hard not only is it to get the children, but the transition after getting the children. And she kind of shed some light on what that looked like. It's, I mean, for the women and the men that are under this, but specifically the women, they are, they don't, they feel completely powerless, mm -hmm. uh, you know, because she even mentions this when, when she was forced out immediately, the caretaker or whoever's in charge of, of her children are telling them that she did something bad, that she wasn't to be trusted anymore. I mean, this is their own mother, and all of a sudden, she's this person that's painted in this bad light that is, for for whatever reason, not worthy to be around them anymore. And so, to your point, of course, she would love to go back and just take her children, but now her children are pitted against her. I mean, and it's it just, it's just, it's really, really difficult. Yeah. So she went down. She drove. Um, she drove there and. When she started kind of looking for them, she went to law enforcement and they were like, you can't just go to the house because if you go to the house, then your children will disappear, which is exactly what happened with the girl who'd been kidnapped by her uncle that we just barely talked about in our last video. Luckily, she has been found, but that's exactly what happened. The mother went to the door, said, I want my child back. They said no. And then all of a sudden, the child disappears. And then law enforcement is trying to find a kidnapper basically. So, um, in this case, law enforcement said, we're not going to do it this way. Like you need to file paperwork and then we can legally go in and forcibly remove them from the situation. So you don't, your kids don't just, um, get kidnapped and disappear completely. So she did go through that process, which took time, which must've been just absolutely excruciating to be waiting for this. Um, but when they got there, you know, when she went in and they're trying to pressure, why would you do this? Why are you doing, you know, all the social pressure and thank goodness she like held her ground and said no. And she talked about how awful the retrieval, like it could have been so easy. They could have just been like, here are your children. And the children like went, um, but instead they hit the children and said, we're not helping you find the children. And so they basically had a huge game of hide and seek. Um, 
it broke my heart when she was talking about like the police officers were having to find and found her little boy and he was just completely terrified and traumatized from it. And they found the other girls. They had to bring in dogs to sniff out where these girls were like hidden up in these high cabinets. And so it ended up being this huge traumatic event for her to finally be able to get her kids back. And if we go if we go back a little bit, I mean, we talk about how hard it was for her to be sent away, right? And, and, and I'm not trying to say that it wasn't. It was very, very hard for her, of course, and for any mother. I, can, I can't even fathom what, they must have, what she must have been feeling. But you also have to consider how difficult it was for, this, for her children. I mean, she's their mother at, at this very young age and a two-year-old. I mean, I mean, yes, it's it's a different lifestyle, and 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 maybe they're living life a little differently. But thinking back when I was a young boy, I I couldn't think of anything more scary than being ripped away from my mother, or to have her ripped away from me and forced out. Like that would that would be the that would have been the most scary thing possible for me. And so these things are happening to these very young children, and then they're and then they're put into a different family. And then when their mother does come back to get them, they have been told all this time that she was this bad person. And, and so now they're afraid to go back with her, you know, it's like back and forth, back and forth. It's just, it's just not good for, for children. And she even said her 18 year old son would not comply. And they ended up having to put him in handcuffs. Um, and I can't imagine how hard, like, you're just trying to get your children back. You're just trying to get your children back. And like you said, children don't, time just flies by so fast. And in a mother's heart, like five years, you still just want your children. That's all right. you want. You're not going to like forget the same way that uh, if you're from two to seven, you don't have this woman and you're constantly told she's evil. You're not even going to have those same, those same feelings of wanting to be with her right. at all. And to, yeah, to have the oldest children too, that these kids do know and that they do love and respect are not complying and saying, no, I'm not going and choosing not to go. Right. Um, it's just going to add like more confusion to the whole situation. Jeez. So it is definitely hard. I, she even talked about the fact, and this is another thing we wanted to bring up that afterwards, a lot of times when these, um, these women get their children back, it's not an easy road from there. So she was talking about how they would try to run away they were still in contact with the um, FLDS people that they were living with before and just what a struggle it was in general, just trying to get them to trust her again and to be able to be able to be that happy family um, again. And that kind of comes into her daughter's situation a little bit. I guess there's one more thing that I did take a note of. Um, she did realize that she was going to go back to her family in Idaho, that they would still love and accept her. And so she did do that. But once she got her children, her husband tried to fight her for custody as a way. She's pretty sure and we're sure as well that the church who, I mean, he's been exiled this whole time, right? And randomly he's fighting for custody, which was basically a power move from the FLDS to try to get these children back into FLDS control and power, right? And so the fact that like now the church, I think he's, he was trying to win points and get good graces with the FLDS church by trying to get his children back, even though he hadn't been allowed to see his children for like, what'd you say, like seven years at that point? But he was still following or... I guess, yeah, following along with the repentance process. So because in the church's eyes, he was doing what he was supposed to be doing to repent, he's still, I guess, in some way or another, a part of it and following the, the church's guidelines. So it's yeah, just crazy it's, that they're still using these people as pawns. Like they're sending them away later, that many years later still. Yeah, yeah. They're sending them away and they're like, maybe someday if you repent and then Seven years later, they're like, oh, well, you know what? If you get your children back and they're like dangling a carrot of coming back. And sometimes it still like surprises me that people want to go back after that long. But even Elizabeth said that it wasn't until she picked up, I kept a note on this, that it wasn't until after picking up her children was the first time she began to question the church. Right. When she, well, and she heard that they weren't being treated well. And, yeah. and so all of a sudden, okay it wasn't okay anymore. And 
But I mean, five years of exile wasn't oh, enough. And, and I don't know if you mentioned this or not, but the uh, during her exile of five years, the, the church was requiring her to pay money. They didn't set her up with a nice job or anything. She was struggling to survive, and they were requiring her to send them money. It was, I mean, they were still using her. Even, oh my gosh, it's just, it's too much. It's too much. Yeah. But... But I mean, that just shows you the power of the amount of um, like loyalty that these members have to their religion. If you can convince someone to be exiled, to repent, to continue to give you money no matter the circumstance for five more years and go through everything she went through and barely be questioning at the end of that, like that tells you the kind of loyalty they have from the beginning, Right. which is just, yeah, it's mm -hmm. a lot. Um, this led to her, um, she had her children back. She did gain custody after a long battle, um, which, again, is just so sad that it took that much just for her to be able to get her children back. But her daughter's name is Elintra Fisher, and she is 16 years old, and she ran away in her mom's car and um, went to her dad, and, you know, the dad was no help, said, I'm not going to send her back. And she has been missing ever since then after she left her father's house. It made it seem like her dad encouraged her to run away to begin with. Yeah, it definitely sounded like because he Because she went right to where he was. And then, of course, her dad is, is not cooperating and, and is trying to keep her from going back to her mom. And at this point... Oh, and then he just dis she disappeared from there because i don't know if she tried to have the the authorities go and find her but she all of a sudden disappeared and now they don't have any idea where she is yes we will put a picture of her um obviously please reach out to any authorities if you do see her um again her name's elintra fisher and right now elizabeth is pretty sure and believes that she is just trying to follow um the flds and they are pretty much, after the last most recent revelations, they are basically rounding up. I know that sounds like a bad way to put it, but that's pretty much what's happening. They're telling the women, no more work, no more school. <clears throat> Come back to the homes and be prepared because marriages are going to be starting again soon. So they are rounding up all the girls. And Elizabeth really fears that her daughter oh, is going to be caught in the midst of that up. and is trying to stay loyal to Warren Jess in that. So please, again... Um, if you see her or have any information on her, please contact your local authorities and help them to be able to find her and hopefully get her out of um, what could be potentially a bad situation in the future with child brides. Yeah. And if you have any specific questions for us or uh, want to know more about this story, feel free to watch the video from uh, Elizabeth herself. As well as feel free to send us an email at growingupinpolygamy at gmail.com. We'd be happy to answer any more questions that we can. Yes. And if we hear any new breaking news on this or find out any more information, we will definitely share it with you all. And we appreciate all of your guys' love and support. And hopefully um, this story will end the same way that the last one did and the girl being found. So, yes. Well, thank you all so much for watching. Thanks for being here. We really do appreciate it. And we'll talk to you soon. Talk to y'all soon.